midst of what appears to be a colossal and history-making blackout. People trapped in elevators and buildings, they have activated the emergency command center. Mayor Bloomberg's advice is to go straight home. The subway system is down. Ottawa is completely without power. People won't forget the night they spent trying to sleep or just stay safe. On the afternoon of August 14, 2003, one of the most advanced electrical networks in the world suddenly failed. Within minutes, over 50 million people across the northeastern United States and parts of Canada were plunged into darkness. It wasn't a terrorist attack, a massive storm, or a cyber hack. It was a combination of overlooked vulnerabilities, unexpected failures, and miscommunication. This is the story of how three trees, a computer glitch, and a series of missed alarms led to the largest blackout in North American history. Act 1. Electricity, our invisible lifeline. Electricity is the backbone of modern life. From lights and refrigerators to hospitals and data centers, everything relies on a steady, uninterrupted flow of power. The power grid that delivers this energy isn't just a bunch of wires and poles. It's one of the most complex machines humanity has ever built. In the US and Canada, the eastern portion of this grid, called the Eastern Interconnection, spans millions of square miles and connects thousands of power plants, substations, and transmission lines. But what makes the grid so tricky is that electricity must always be in balance. At every moment, supply must match demand. And unlike water or fuel, we can't store electricity in large quantities. That means the system must be continuously monitored and adjusted in real time. Now, let's rewind to a hot summer day in 2003. Act two, a normal day with underlying problems. August 14th, 2003 wasn't unusually hot, just a typical summer day, but the heat was enough to push up demand due to widespread air conditioning use. In Northern Ohio, several power plants were offline for maintenance. This wasn't uncommon, and the grid operator, MISO, the Midwest Independent System Operator, believed everything was still under control. But quietly, the system was already beginning to falter. Three major technical weaknesses had appeared. One, some high-voltage transmission lines had gone offline due to contact with vegetation. Two, a critical power generator was struggling to handle reactive power demands. And three, a software bug had disabled one of the most essential monitoring tools on the grid. Act three, blind spots in the system. Let's talk about grid monitoring. Operators use thousands of sensors across the network. These feed into a tool called a state estimator, which gives them a snapshot of what's happening at any moment. But on that day, MISO state estimator wasn't working properly. Why? Because it was missing key data, specifically information about transmission lines that had tripped in neighboring regions. The system couldn't reconcile the numbers, so it just gave up. Without that tool, another system called real-time contingency analysis couldn't run. This tool is like a what-if machine. What if a power line fails? What if a generator trips? These simulations help operators stay ahead of potential disasters. But that tool was offline for most of the day. In other words, the grid was flying blind. Act 4, trouble in Ohio. Meanwhile, in Ohio, First Energy, the local utility, was struggling with low voltage levels. That happens when there's not enough reactive power on the grid. Power that helps maintain voltage and keep motors running smoothly. To compensate, operators pushed a generator at East Lake Power Plant to boost its reactive power output but they pushed it too far. At 1.30 p.m., the generator's protective system kicked in and shut it down. That left Cleveland and the surrounding area even more dependent on importing power from outside. And that meant more stress on transmission lines. To make matters worse, First Energy's internal alarm system crashed shortly afterward. Data was still being collected, but operators weren't being alerted to problems. They had no idea that multiple transmission lines were starting to fail. Act 5. The dominoes start falling. Around 3 p.m., one of the key transmission lines, Harding Chamberlain, sagged into a tree and shorted out. On a hot day, transmission lines expand and droop. If they're not trimmed properly, they can touch trees and create a fault. A relay detected the short and shut the line down, 
as it should. But with the alarm system down, no one in First Energy's control room noticed. The load then shifted to other lines, increasing their current and heat. 30 minutes later, another line, Henna Juniper, sagged into a tree and tripped. Then Star South Canton failed the same way. Each failure forced more power on a fewer lines, like water trying to squeeze through smaller pipes. It couldn't keep up. Between 3 o'clock and 4 p.m., at least 20 transmission lines failed, most for the same reason, sagging into vegetation. But the operators still didn't fully grasp what was happening. They were receiving desperate calls from plant managers reporting erratic voltages and surging currents. One plant operator said, we're not gonna last much longer. You're about to have a big problem. They were right. Act six, grid collapse. At 4.05 p.m., the last major transmission line into Cleveland, Star Samus, tripped. It was overloaded and misinterpreted the surge as a fault. That was the final straw. With no way to feed electricity into Cleveland, the power surged elsewhere, trying to find alternate paths. It pushed north into Michigan, then east into New York and Ontario, overloading everything in its path. Lines, substations, and even entire power plants began shutting down automatically. Relays, especially long-range Zone 3 protection systems, interpreted the unusual conditions as faults and disconnected equipment. In just three minutes, the eastern interconnection shattered into isolated islands of power. Without balance between generation and demand, frequency dropped rapidly. Entire regions lost power. By 4.10 p.m., 50 million people were without electricity. Act 7. The Aftermath Water systems lost pressure. Phone networks failed. Airports, subways, elevators, traffic lights, all went dead. Emergency services were overwhelmed. Hospitals ran on backup generators. Food spoiled. Businesses shut down. In total, the blackout cost an estimated $10 billion and is believed to have contributed to nearly 100 deaths. But there was one bit of good news, because very little physical equipment was actually damaged. Most areas had power restored within hours. Only a few locations remained down into the next day. Act 8, what we learned. After the incident, the U.S. and Canada formed a joint task force to investigate. Their report was 240 pages long and made 46 key recommendations. Some of the major changes that followed. Mandatory reliability standards were enforced for utilities. Vegetation management became stricter. Coordination between grid operators improved. And critical monitoring and alarm systems were upgraded and tested regularly. Still, today's grid faces new challenges, climate change, cyber threats, increased dependence on renewables, and greater demand. We've come a long way since 2003, but the fundamental truth remains. Our power grid is a delicate balance of physics, engineering, and human decision-making. A slow pan of nighttime cities glowing peacefully. Narrator, the 2003 blackout was a warning. A quiet summer day reminded us that even the most advanced systems can fail if we stop paying attention. And in the age of growing complexity, the question is no longer could it happen again, but rather, are we prepared when it does? Thanks for watching. I'm Grady, and this has been Practical Engineering.